speak with you a little bit and interact with you a bit, particularly on this Black Solidarity Day, and to talk about consciousness, culture, and power. In some sense, sort of uh, continuing our prior discussion in terms of consciousness, which off the back to many people may seem somewhat abstract, but uh, it is not an abstract situation. Consciousness is not an abstraction. It is a very concrete presence in the human mind and uh, in our lives as people. One of the things that this culture tries to do very much to African people is to make us resist abstractions or things that sound abstract. Yet, it is in terms of the abstract that people act, that people actually control their behavior and uh, the means by which people organize their behavior. Take the word nation. I mean, really, what is it in reality? You cannot just find it in any concrete place or circumstance, and yet you could organize whole armies and people around the concept of nation. Nation as a symbol. You can generate all types of emotional feelings. You can move people to sacrifice their lives, to give their all in terms of what is essentially an abstraction. Nation. And from the abstraction nation, we get the further abstraction nationalism. And yet nationalism has been the symbolic foundation by which means people have organized themselves and overthrown their oppressors, by which means colonialism has been rolled back and people have come to achieve an identity that has permitted them to operate as one and to mutually benefit one and the other. Those who rule us, you see, would like for us not to be comfortable with things that are not immediately concrete, with things that we cannot see in a tangible form or feel with our hands or feel in a material way. They seek to make then the black consciousness a concrete consciousness, to make it just a hands-on consciousness, you see. Because that is the kind of, that is the consciousness of servants. The consciousness of masters is the consciousness that wrestles with symbols and ideas, that wrestles with mathematics and logic, and uses those symbols to control the world and to change the world and to transform the world organize it and direct it. Therefore, the masters of this world would like to make us think that abstract thinking is their preserve and not the preserve of those who serve. And many of us as African people have fallen for that kind of distinction. Many of us have tried to define our blackness in terms of our concreteness only and not in terms of our ability to manipulate symbols and use symbols and manipulate abstractions as means of moving our behavior. European is sought to make us a concrete people and a people who are only connected to the immediate by disconnecting us from our history and by taking over the responsibility for our past and therefore making us not responsible for our past or responsible for our future. You see, in order to move into the past, one has to abstract himself or herself from the present, to move from the immediate, and yet to be moved by that which is not immediate, that which is not tangible, but yet in many ways is very important. When you deny then a people a past and a long past, in a sense, in effect, you begin 
to impair their abstract capacities and their abstract abilities. And you begin to impair their abilities to understand the present and redirect their behavior in the present in terms of the past, in terms of something that is not there in the immediate present. When you rob a people of responsibility for their future, again, rob them of having to move from the present into the future, to use their imagination, to use concepts that are placed into the distant future, and yet look at that future, deal with that future, as a means of changing behavior in the present so that that future can be realized or avoided. So consequently, when African people, particularly African American people, were cut off from our past, and when we were made not responsible for our future, when the future was placed in the hands of another people, our ability to act in terms of abstraction, in terms of the not so immediate, but in terms of the future and based on the past were impaired and consequently many of us are caught up in the immediate present, in the immediately concrete. We have a short attention span and a short uh, mental span this is the kind of stand for people who have been prepared to be servants, whose role in life is to carry out order and order only. The tradition I mentioned is referred to as tantine in the Cameroon, but I think another West African word for it is isusu, coming out of Nigeria. I believe that the word susu still remains in the Caribbean African tradition. One of the beautiful things about this is that it can be practiced in families and small groups between any number of groups. Thus, we can plan in this fashion for raising money and funding our economic development. I think this piece is just, I think this piece I just read about the Korean can also be instructive. There's a book by Ivan Light called Ethnic Enterprises in America which talks about ethnicity in America in terms of economics. In the main lecture, I skipped over a section that dealt with history and sociothera sociotherapy. We have to use history as a means of reconstructing our personality and reconstructing ourselves. If we found these kinds of economic organizations, it also becomes necessary to reconstruct social relations to foster trust, relatability, and other positive social characteristics. To go into them purely as economic operations, given the tremendous brainwashing as many of us African Americans have received, and the tremendous amount of alienation that has been projected onto our personality, sometimes means that we may set ourselves up for disappointment. So we should plan on a number of levels. One level, of course, is the economic one. The other, which I think is the most fundamentally important one, is developing a strong sense of social belongingness in the group. Getting people to meet their monthly obligation or however you choose to put money in the pot pretty much relies on the group's ability to apply social pressure and upon the person's fear of social ostracism and the loss of esteem in, the, in that group. If the person does not fear a loss of esteem or does not fear social pressure, then you will have people dropping out when they got their million, leaving you in the hut, leaving you in the lurch. Excuse me, leaving you in the lurch. So a part of the deal is we must figure out ways that we can build a very strong social unit. As a matter of fact, and part of this Cameroonian article, when members got into a situation where they could not meet the obligations of the group, their social ties were strong, were so strong that some of them actually deleted themselves rather than not meet the obligations of their group. I'm not suggesting that people go that deeply. However, I do want to stress the importance of first rebuilding and overcoming the alienation that has been projected unto us as a people. You do not need a wholesale structure organization with this kind of plan. It could begin in the home, the community, within your social group, 
From there, it can again begin to become tradition. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Happy Monday. Welcome back to On the Shoulders of Giants. I'm Joseph Ward, continuing my reading of Dr. Amos Wilson's The Falsification of African Consciousness, Eurocentric History, Psychiatry, and the Politics of White Supremacy. And I'm picking up on uh, looks like an, a conversation that Dr. Amos Wilson is having. And the person is giving what I just read to you was Dr. Amos Wilson's first response to the line of questions. So he's talking about in order to effectively build an economic unit, uh, economic culture, uh, you know, economic structure, we have to restructure the way we think and see ourselves as individuals and restructure the way we think and see ourselves as a group. We don't trust each other when it comes to money on a large enough scale. We do have examples, which I am very proud of. We do have examples of groups of black people coming together, raising money and creating things for themselves. Um, I believe it was a group of people somewhere in Georgia who put their money together and brought some land and built a community on this land. That's that's what we're talking about. But in order for that to stick, the mentality has to change. We have to grow up. We have to replace the program, as I say every week. We have learned to not trust each other. We have learned to only trust the white man, only trust the oppressor, only trust people who don't look like you, which is a big problem, especially when we're talking about in terms of building for ourselves. People who don't trust themselves cannot build with themselves. We will go around in circles. We'll start something, get to a point to where somebody's not happy, Somebody drop out, somebody else drop out. Next thing you know, it's like one person standing. The trust isn't there. It hasn't been rebuilt, but we haven't taken the time to rebuild ourselves mentally, physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually on all those different levels. We haven't taken the time to rebuild ourselves. And that's what uh, Dr. Wilson is uh, encouraging us to do, to make sure that we spend time building ourselves up as individuals, but also building ourselves up as a community, as a neighborhood, as a city, you know, whatever, uh, you know, I'm not asking to start off on some kind of large scale movement, but the people around you, the black people around you get together. We need to get together and make something happen in any kind of way. Use your skill sets in any kind of way, but get together and make things happen for ourselves. We have to build for ourselves. We have to educate ourselves. We have to, have to empower ourselves. It's all on us. Self, 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 self-esteem, self-evaluation, self-image, self, whatever you want to put behind it. It all starts with us. And this is what Dr. Wilson is encouraging us to do. He's reminding us that our mindset is the way it is because of the conditioning that we received during slavery and during Jim Crow. Our history and our identity was purposely taken away from us so this negro mindset can be implanted in us and that is how we operate we operate as a destructive regressive group of people but that can change that can change we have plenty of examples of black people cleaning ourselves up what uh my brother uh carl tone jones put me on the term uh wukusu wake up clean up stand up we could do it and get that from Malcolm X, right? Malcolm X was able to wake up, clean up, stand up. I mean, look at the life that he was living before he came into uh, the, the information that the Nation of Islam gave. And look at the, the pristine person that he was when he passed, right? That's just one example. There's plenty of examples of black people cleaning themselves up. But we have to clean ourselves up in the right way, not in a way to empower the system of white supremacy but in a way to build something concrete for black people that can be powerful. So I'm jumping back in on page 55, the second question. The question is, I think of the church as a very valuable institution. How do you see the church and what should it become? So Dr. Wilson's answer is, of course, the major role of the church is one of propagating and encouraging spirituality, ethics, and rightful behavior among people. Some people would say salvation also, but the church 
is a social institution like any other institution. It does not have to stick with that definition and the perception of itself. When you look at ads on TV and hear them on the radio, you'll note that they are designed to bypass a person's critical and, and analytical scrutiny. They're designed to speak directly to the emotions so that the person acts in terms of feelings instead of reason. Sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? We're promoting feelings instead of really reason, right? Therefore, emotions are the bread and butter of advertising and ultimately in this society, the bread and butter of the economic social systems. So often we as Africans in America are encouraged to be emotional and spiritual. Often we confuse the two things to the exclusion of critical thinking. We are kept in this emotional, spiritual state, and it is a bogus kind of state. It opens us to manipulation by external forces such that we cannot bring to bear on our everyday problems, common sense and reasoning. So while the church may see its primary role as maintaining spirituality, fostering an emotional, spiritual relationship with God, it must also recognize that we are people living on earth and that we are a people who must feed and protect our children and our economic interests. Therefore, the church can and should play an economic role in African-American life. Right. Spot on. He's spot on. That comes from studying the behavior of people, studying the behavior of ourselves, but also studying the behavior of our oppressors. Right. These social sciences were created to be able to study all these things. And black people were the lab rats, right? But they understand how we react emotionally. We don't act emotionally, we react emotionally, right? And so that's why they know, that's how they know how to keep us at a subservient state. You spark their emotional interest, you spark their emotional response, and you're gonna have them. It's gonna be continuous, a continuous, uh, reinvigorating or re-stimulating of that emotional response so that we continue to do the same things over and over and over. It's how, it's about how we feel rather than what's right for us or what's best for us. And as long as we're operating off of how we feel, we'll never get to what's best for us. Logic must trump feelings. In our dire situation, because we're looking at ourselves being fourth class citizens in America right now. In our dying situation, logic must always trump feelings. There's an interesting book by R.H. Towney called Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. Also, Weber wrote a book in this vein, as well as about the relationship of Protestantism and capitalism showing that there's a very clear relationship between the founding of Protestantism and the advancement and development of Western capitalism. Additionally, it shows that there's a relationship between the nature and the theology of the Catholic Church and certain economic structures. So whether you want to recognize it or not, the church and religion are intimately related to the economic and social structure. So the church is not separate from money and economics by any stretch of the imagination. This means that we as black people have a right to redefine the church in ways that advance our interests, not only economic interests, but social, political, and many other interests in our lives. We need to look at the church in the context of African life and see how the church, without losing its spiritual or ethical mission, can also function to enhance African economic, social, and political life. Often, people who are economically crushed and economically expo exploited are people who are weighed down with a sense of guilt, sin, and other kinds of problems. If we study the theology and the life of Jesus, we will read of his struggle with the ideology coming out of the major religious establishment of his time. That establishment was also a part of the economic order and structure that rationalized and idealized the then economic structure in such a way that people were literally forced into poverty and in many instances forced into sin and degradation. So one of the one of the major long-standing institutions in the black American community or black American culture is the black church. And there was a point where the black church was an 
a, a true communal hub for the black community where the black community could go to the church and it served as a human service organization, not just a spiritual organization. So this is what Dr. Amos Wilson is getting at, having that human service angle as well as the spiritual angle, right? Being able to foster economics, promote economics, help build economics, have an economic structure that the church supports and the community supports. Therefore, the church and the community can enrich and empower themselves because the key is self-sufficiency, right? The key is not relying on the government for what we need, but we have the right of free enterprise within this capitalistic system. So use that right of free enterprise and create and build for ourselves. But it, may, it must start somewhere. We must have a foundational hub for it. And Dr. Wilson is saying, well, since the church has already been a foundational hub in the black church, the black church has to be revitalized or that that ideology, that mindset, those those goals of the black church have to be revitalized or instituted altogether or reinstituted. Right. So the church does not have to just play the role of the spiritual institution. It could play the role of the human service institution and be able to empower the community resources the church can get resources some churches have resources using those resources properly and also not using those resources in a way that make the community dependent upon the church but empowers the community so the community can work in conjunction with the church the church by reconstructing by reconstructing itself and by revising its view of itself economically and its role economically not only can enhance the material well-being of the people but also can better carry out its spiritual, ethnical function as an institution. The black church has tremendous value as an economic institution. We have church institutions now creating housing, which means that we can be, begin to use the church and it can become an instrument of black ownership and communities, lands and properties. These churches are nationally organized institutions. They have hierarchies and systems of communication, etc which means that we have already had national organizations and national networks in the forms of our church organizations. This means that much more information can be carried through our churches. These churches can build and encourage businesses. If they build businesses across this country, we can then build a national network of black businesses, which will lay the foundation for black manufacturing. It does not do us any good to manufacture and have no place to sell our products. But when the church brings its political weight to bear and demands white and other merchants uh, who own supermarkets and other businesses make room for black manufactured products, the black manufacturers can get on the shelves of these supermarkets, department stores and other kinds of outlets. When the church creates shopping malls, buildings and other things, it creates jobs for construction. It then stimulates the building, manufacturing and business organizations. So much could grow out of the church viewing itself as an economic unit. And that's I agree with that. I agree with that. Being able to see the greater picture for the community, not just looking at the at, it, at the church, not just looking at itself as as a, a, a one trick pony, that's just the spiritual component. But that communal component, that economic component, that de that de development component, there are churches throughout the United States who do, who do have that mindset and who do those things. But we need more of them. Once you build this distribution system and it becomes a national system, which means we are organized as a nation economically, we then are in a position to create a relationship with our African family overseas <clears throat> because we have an economic base here. We have a manufacturing base here. We have a, a, a base that we can use to empower ourselves, but we have a base that we have products and we have goods and services that we can export. Right. So then with the power that we and the church have economically and politically, we can open up the United States, which is one of the largest economic markets in the world, to the sale of African products. We can then receive these products and be responsible for their distribution in this nation. Thus, we can enrich our African brothers, laying the basis for their manufacturing and technological development. Therefore, now, not only do we have our products that we're selling, but 
we're helping to sell the products of the African people of the African diaspora within the United States, because as Dr. Wilson said, it is a large economic base. It's a large uh, trading base. It's a large base where commerce happens, right? So because they'll have the American markets open to them, right? What would happen if we sold as many African-made radios and boom boxes to Africa's adolescents as the Japanese is our seller? Or nowadays, what if we sold the same amount of computers, cell phones, and all these other things that these other nations are selling? And not only are we selling them, but we're selling them that is we're using products that is that does not exploit us, does not lead us to being greedy and exploiting ourselves, and they're environmentally friendly. We're not breaking down the environment, but we're working with the environment and being able to use its products in the best way. So before long, Africans would be in a technologically advanced position rather than rather that of Japan and other nations. So when viewing, so the viewing of the church and other organizations, not only as spiritual organizations, but also as economic organizations can lay the foundation and basis for economic political advancement of African man in the world. If we only narrowly see ourselves as a spiritual people, become otherworldly, and only see ourselves as living well after we die, then, of course, we're going to catch hell in two places, on earth and after we die. That's all I'm saying. Got to think outside the box. We have to see ourselves as not just dependent, but able to produce for ourselves, able to build for ourselves a powerful people, a power structure. Another question. I am presently taking a course in Western history. Can you state any suggestions on how we can maneuver in this class as a student? So Dr. Wilson answers. I'm not one who advances, who advocates only the taking of African courses. I believe that if you really achieve your identity, then you can walk among any people. The white mentally, the white mentality is not going to rub off on you. If you know who you are, and what you are about, you can expose yourself to other people and other people's knowledge. There's nothing wrong with understanding the psychology of other people. And we must understand the psychology by studying the history of the civilizations, etc. The important thing is that we have an African perspective when we do so. When you have an African perspective and consciousness, you can take that knowledge and transform it for your own use, right? just as the European knowledge of African history, civilization, and culture. And believe me, they have, an, they have the knowledge. It is, excuse me, they have the knowledge is used to European advantage. We can use the knowledge of European history and so-called civilization to our own advantage. If the learning of European history and so-called civilization and the absence of a knowledge of who and what we are that destroys us, not just the learning of them or the studying of them, it's the studying of them in the absence of this knowledge, i.e. knowledge of African history. When you read the history of Shaka Zulu and other African leaders, you will learn political science. You will learn how to control nations and empires. You will learn what destroys nations and what maintains nations and groups. You will learn stagecraft and administration. You will learn all of those things, all of those things, because those things are embedded in the history of our people. So if you have grounded yourself and your personality in your own history and African tradition and your consciousness is Afrocentric, then the European courses can be of value to you. On a certain level, you can enjoy them. You can enjoy the pleasure of seeing through them. You can enjoy determining why they are distorted. You can see the lies. It really becomes a challenge, a pleasurable challenge in a way to see the intellectual shallowness of it all to see the backwardness of it all, to see the regressiveness contained in it all. Much of European philosophy is a regressive, is regressive and infantile. African philosophy is exceedingly profound. Just because we don't have African philosophy written in books doesn't mean it's not profound. There's a there's profound philosophy, ideology, and outlook in African tradition. And I completely agree with what he's saying in this section about being able to walk among others and immerse yourself in others, ideologies, philosophies, uh, education and things to learn them and learn more about yourself. But 
in order to do that and not assimilate, you must have that African consciousness, that African mindset. You must know who you are, study your history, your background, your culture, uh, be embedded, know your psychology, know your philosophies, know, the, know your ideologies, knowing who you are fully, right? Not just in theory or just talking about knowing who you are, but really, really knowing who you are. Dr. Clark said it a while ago. Of course he did, right? Dr. Clark said it a while ago. I saw a video a while ago of Dr. Clark saying, study everything. And I've repeated that for a while. I'm a proponent of studying as much of world history as you can. Spend a great deal of your time studying the history of African people in Africa and outside of Africa. Spend a great deal of your time studying the philosophies and ideologies of African people inside of Africa and outside of Africa. And once you have a full understanding of African people, African philosophies, African ideas, African economics, African ways of living, African ways of conducting ourselves, we can move into learning and studying others, right? It's important for us to learn and study those who have oppressed us, but not just those who have oppressed us, but those who have watched us be oppressed. Those who've benefited from us being oppressed. So we have no friends. We have no true allies. No other groups of people have shown us that they are true allies. No other groups of people have shown us that they can consistently be considered friends. We haven't even shown ourselves over the last 600 years that we can consistently call ourselves friends. So we know we can't put that on people outside of ourselves. But that is going back to what we talked about in the beginning, the reprogramming of ourselves, the building the trust between us, right? The building the trust between African people throughout the diaspora. The building of trust between Black people here in America. It's okay to recognize your nationality, your heritage, your culture. But as Malcolm X said, when we get together, you leave all of that at the door and we become black people and we become one and we operate as one. We one, one group of people, what they say, one band, one sound, one African people, one sound, one heartbeat, one mindset. Oh, 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 the mono, the monolith, the monolithic mindset has to come in there. We have to be able to be on one accord, being codified, right? African people moving forward. Therefore, we are going into this world with our code of conduct, sticking to our code of conduct, and therefore it will prevent us from assimilating into white culture. Those of us who truly, truly, truly learned ourselves and studied ourselves. You can go into the white world, exist in the white world, and not become of the white world and not see yourself depending on the white world. You can get what you need from the white world and come back to your world and empower yourselves. You can do that in any world, not just the white world, the Asian world, the Arab world, whatever. You can do it. So the last part of this, the acquiring of an African-centered ideology, the infusion of an ideology developed out of one's own history and experiences reduces civil war, mutual destruction, and the kinds of troubles we see our people in so much today. Lehman said something like, the capitalist will sell you the rope by which to hang him. The European, by exposing his history, ideology, and knowledge the way he does, is literally putting the rope in our hands with which we can hang him. But we can't hang him unless we possess the African-centered consciousness. So get it. Go into the courses and get that rope. Get it, get it, get it. The African consciousness. Empower ourselves to become more than just servants, to become more than just slaves, to become more than just labor for not just the European, but the Caucasian, the Asian, the Arab, all other groups of people who are not us. Competition is high. We're most likely now relegated to the fourth class rungs of American society. And we've done it to ourselves because we've refused to get our minds right, literally, figuratively as well, right? 
to reconstruct ourselves, to rebuild ourselves, but it has to start with the mind. How we see ourselves, breaking the chains of psychological slavery. African consciousness has been falsified by the oppressor. And it's time to take our minds back so we can take back our place, our rightful place in this world as free people dictating our own destiny, dictating our own lives, dictating our own quality of lives and living the peace that we want to live because we've gained our peace. We've earned our peace by becoming the powerful people that we were destined to be. We can do it. I know we can. So let's do it. Like, comment, subscribe, share. The falsification of African consciousness, European history, psychiatry, and the politics of white supremacy by Dr. Amos Wilson. Um, make sure you get your copy. There's a link in the description for everybody to get a copy, not only of that book, but of any book that we have read during these reading series. I want to give a shout out to uh, May Neely, uh, my new patron, May Neely, and Halima Avila. Halima Avila, I want to give a shout out to you. Thank you for becoming a patron. And May Neely, my latest patrons, I want to give you, you guys shout outs. I appreciate the support. I appreciate the support. Not only are you supporting this channel, but you're going to be supporting my own the shoulders of Giants Black History School. And I want to give a big shout out to me, Kim. Me, Kim constantly supports me. I really, 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 truly appreciate you and your support. Once again, your support does not just go to making this channel better, but it goes to supporting the Black History School and making sure we have what we need to empower the children that I'm working with. I love you all. I appreciate everything that you do for me. I appreciate everybody who's rocking with me, hanging with me, just helping this channel grow. We will. The goal is 100,000 subs. I ask you for your help to get, help me get to 100,000 subs. So please continue to like these videos, hit that like button, comment, share, make sure you, as many people as you know can see this information and let's grow and let's glow because on the shoulders, on the shoulders of giants is on a mission to empower as many black people as possible. So thank you all. I'll see y'all next time.